Thank you for the introduction. Although it's a quite challenging task to raise the blood pressure in the room after lunch, but uh, I will try my best. So uh, the topic I would like to introduce you today is a joint work uh, with Natalia and Claude, and uh, it's about a specific way of uh, leaking information online on the web, and I would like to look into this, that whether is it uh, possible to track users with these uh, pieces of information, uh, which, has, which are related to extensions and uh, logins that we have online. So very briefly, I would like to give an introduction to what the status quo is of the privacy on the web. When we browse websites, there are trackers who are tracking our activities, and they use identifiers to, to categorize uh, what we do and what our interests. Of course, this is uh, probably uh, very familiar to you all. And they use this for targeted advertising, which is a good in a sense that we might see advertisements which are interesting for us, but it can also be abused in many, many other ways, and this is why we have the new regulation and the uh, new law coming up uh, next year. The question is that how these identifiers are handled, and actually the basic way the, the, the trackers were, uh, were, were uh, handling these identifiers was just simply creating a unique identifier for each of the browsers that they see and just store it on the computer, and these were called the so-called cookies. Although in the recent years there were many, many efforts to uh, move these identifiers to other storages which are more hidden, uh, from the user eyes because, of course, users were deleting cookies and which was not good for the advertisers for many reasons. And there were many, many attempts to get around the awareness of the users. And in recent years, uh, because of these cat and mouse games that we have seen for the storage-based uh, identifiers, there were new techniques that started to emerge, which were called the fingerprinting. The first academic presentation, which was uh, uh, done on a larger set of computers, was the Panoptic project, which showed that uh, for more than 200,000 computers, it was possible to uniquely identify 95% of the browsers, which was quite, quite impressive. And um, for those uh, who don't know, this fingerprinting was just concerning the technical details of the browser itself. Later on, one year later, we introduced uh, another project in which we wanted to show that uh, this fingerprinting on the technical details can be done uh, in a cross-browser method, which means that if the user changes the browser, there are still enough information available about, about the operating system that the user can be still tracked in, the, in, the, in, in different browsers while we don't have access and we don't want to have access to any storage. And it was also working. Actually, these techniques were not highly adopted, and I'm going to just talk in one sentence about this. In 2013, according to a study, there was only a very small fraction of the top sites adopting these techniques, although we have seen another study last year which showed that the penetration is getting wide and uh, there is no reason why we should uh, say that it's going to stop at this point and it will decrease. It's very likely to increase more aggressively than before. And where is the point where our project comes, comes into this whole picture? All these fingerprinting techniques were considering technical properties of the browser. So actually it's more related to your device and not the user itself. And actually there have been some things that could be considered as a behavioral pattern of the user, like uh, these uh, fingerprinting techniques were considering the fonts that were installed on the computer, which is a kind of fingerprint uh, behavioral pattern of the user because each of us install different software on a computer, which install different fonts, and actually the fonts that are detectable are kind of a reflection of uh, what we do on our computers, and even if it changed the computer itself, we might bring along the same installations and the same fonts, which might mean that we can be trackable. There was another study that also showed, um, I think it was last year or uh, beginning of this year, that showed that the history patterns is also highly identifiable. It's possible to de-anonymize users, and uh, the, uh, this also uh, shows that there's another factor that can be used for behavioral tracking. And this is where our, uh, our research comes into the picture, uh, as we are considering two behavioral uh, vectors uh, for, for measuring the extent of the privacy loss or the possibility of tracking. One is uh, the extensions that we install in our browsers. How do they contribute uh, to the lack of privacy? And uh, how... Uh, because websites may, can detect the extensions that we install. And also we want to, to evaluate that how the web logins that we have to other sites can be used to track us or to leak information about us. So let's discuss these two topics briefly. 
And after that, I would like to show you a demonstration. So if you are interested, whether you are trackable, don't worry, there's a website that you can use. But I would like to, kind, I would like to uh, ask you kindly that don't use it while I'm going to do the demonstration for some reasons. So why is it a problem that extensions can, can be leaked? So if I go to a website, then the website can learn what are the extensions that I have installed. Of course, this can be used to detect if I have an ad blocker, even if I turn it on, which is a problem. But it can also reveal much more sensitive information about me. Like, for instance, there you have an extension here, which can be actually detected by the website that we are uh, working on and you know, what I'm going to show you. And this can be sensitive information. And there are some others, of course, but I think this is a nice example. Or, as everybody in the room, I assume, is privacy conscious, you would think that, okay, I want to have more privacy, I install more extensions, but actually the fact is that the more extensions you install, the less privacy you will have. Because we will be, it will be possible to detect the extensions and it will be possible to track you. So this is bad news. <coughs> Sorry. So, what are we doing here? We are using a method that was uh, published uh, in the recent years in this paper, and there was also a demo, and it was focusing on the extent of detecting extensions in the browser. Although there have been many, many attempts, like likely in the last decade, that have been considering this, uh, this feature. And uh, we built our tool on, on this, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, previous work. What does it do? When you, when you install an extension, it installs files onto your computer, and there are some files that needs to be accessed uh, by this extension in a way that it has to make it publicly available, which means that websites can even load these, these resources. So for instance, here you can see uh, a URL which, uh, which refers to a Ghostery uh, resource, and you can see that Ghostery is use it, using it for the user interface it has, and actually it has a unique link, so it can, it can be uh, detected with uh, zero false positives. And uh, this is a resource that web any website can detect if you have it on your computer or not. And actually, this is not true only for Ghostery. You can see that roughly one third of the extensions that you have in the Chrome store are vulnerable to this kind of attack, which is a quite uh, large fraction. And actually, it doesn't stop at Chrome, although our experiment is highly focusing on Chrome. There are, so there are, there are many other browsers who are vulnerable to the same attack. Like Firefox is, is having the same problem, but due to the construction of Firefox, uh, there are less extensions who need to have this kind of specific resources. So there are only 7% of the extensions that are detectable. And as Opera is using the same uh, um, engine uh, as Chrome, it is vulnerable to the same attack. Or we also check the Brave browser, which is actually trying to disguise uh, itself uh, as a Chrome browser. So if you look at the properties, you will see as a website that this is a Chrome browser. But the Brave, Brave browser is coming with, for instance, a WebTorrent extension. And actually, you can detect it. So for instance, if you use the Brave browser, you can go to this URL and you can test that it will detect that you're coming with Brave. Are there any Brave users in the room, by the way? OK, no. Anyway, you should try it out, by the way. So uh, and of course, it is also possible to do this in Edge but uh, there are like 20, 35 extensions in the store, so it's not so interesting. Although I have to admit that since I'm here in Vienna, I received an official email from Microsoft that they would like to ask us to uh, make our test for Edge as well, which is an interesting inquiry. We will consider it. So these are the extensions detections. Let's see the other, other side. Why is detecting third-party logins a problem? Which means, I, I repeat again, uh, just for the clarification, that if you go to a new site, the new site could detect that you're logged into PayPal, that you logged into uh, uh, to, uh, eBay, or whatever other websites which are vulnerable to, to these attacks. It is a problem because it allows precise profiling. It reveals your interests, and uh, it, it might reveal things that you don't want to have. It can leak sensitive information, like for instance, this, is, uh, uh, this icon is referring to dating sites. Uh, which we don't have in the test, but it would be also possible to, to measure that if people are logged into dating sites uh, when they serve the web. And actually, this can be also a security problem because if there's a website which is a malicious website and it detects that you're logged into PayPal, then you might be a target for phishing attacks. So it can also tell that where you work. Like, for instance, where I work, we have an intranet, and it can be detected if you're logged into the intranet or not uh, by any third-party websites. And we believe that this information can contribute to tracking. And this is what we want to measure uh, in the research that we are doing. 
We have 60 sites in the list that we are working with. You see that we have multiple categories, and these are highly uh, safer sites. We didn't consider uh, sensitive information like related to religion, uh, dating and stuff, but actually we know that uh, there are some other websites who are vulnerable to this attack, and actually it's much more sensitive, but uh, for several reasons we decided that we are not going to include this. So the techniques that we built upon were also developed before, but it was just demonstrated that this works. And we developed this library uh, based on the work that we have seen before to a larger extent to see that if it's possible to use it for fingerprinting. How does, how does it work? Let me brief, briefly introduce you. This is really, uh, this might get complicated in some cases, so I will just discuss the, the surface. So let's say that if you go to INRIA, you want to open the calendar by a, by a URL. If you're not logged in, you will get to a login page, which is something like this. And this is simplified. And the login page will uh, indicate that you have to be returned to the calendar after you log in. This is a very useful functionality. Uh, the problem is that uh, if this return is not checked, we can just put there a logo. We can embed it into a third party website in a place where the user doesn't see. And if the, if the image loads, then we can know that the user is not logged in because for the image, there's a, there's a login page which is going to emerge. Or if the image loads, that we can know that the user is logged in. It's very simple. This is how one of our techniques work. And the other technique is based on the content security policy, which uh, is a technique to tell browsers that uh, there are some things that cannot be done with a website. For instance, you cannot just uh, include websites, uh, webs resources from another website, they might disable this feature for you. And actually, the, uh, with uh, CSP, you can make restrictions. For instance, in this case, uh, case, you can make a restriction that I would like to load this image, which, uh, which is uh, related to this URL, and it, this URL cannot change. And of course, if you're logged into eBay, you will stay on this URL, although it's not going to be a valid image, so you will not see that. But if, if you're not logged into eBay, that it will redirect to, a, to another domain, and this can be detected, and, 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 uh, and the browser can be forced to report this error back to the, browser, to the, to the back end of the service. So I hope that uh, this was clear. Now I would like to show you a demonstration, and this is the URL that you can use. But please just let me show it first, and after that I let you play around. Currently, uh, we have roughly uh, 19, uh, less than 19,000 uh, uh, users who have contributed uh, to the test. Although uh, this is a raw number, so we have to filter it and whatsoever. So this is the website we have, and uh, here, here I can just start a test. And what you see here is totally live. Okay. So here is a, an avatar, which is my uh, unique avatar. If you start a test, you will have the same. And here you can see that extensions are being tested. You can also see that we have roughly 14,000 extensions uh, that we have crawled from the Chrome store, which are detectable, and this is a quite high number. And actually, even the more popular the extension is, the higher the probability that it will be detectable. And you can see that this test finds in lifetime, uh, li in, uh, in uh, real time, uh, the extensions that I have installed. So I have Ghostery, I have Flash Control, Adblock, whatsoever. I have some other things, but uh, this is something that it couldn't find. And here, perhaps you have also seen that on the bottom, it was also looking for the logins uh, where I am. And you can see that it find a couple. So uh, I encourage you to also try out this on your computer. We are going to only collect anonymous data. We also have a privacy policy. If you have suggestions, it, it's uh, all welcome. And uh, please also spread uh, the details about this website. It's highly user-friendly, and we really hope that we manage to get more uh, feedback from users. So, and the, and the last thoughts would be uh, what we can do about this kind of uh, tracking. Is there something that we could do? Of course, what we would like to have, there are two things uh, beside the research. We would like to have the big companies to change their services, like Google to change the browser, how it works, and like the other companies who are having problems with the logins to change their login mechanism to make it uh, safer. But uh, until we wait for these giants to move, let's see what we can do as users. So for the extension detection, unfortunately, there are not too many things you can do. Basically, we tested multiple browsers, uh, and it seems that the Firefox browser is the most secure uh, for several reasons. 
Uh, first of all, it has currently a low number of extensions that can be detected. And the second of all, the, the uh, extension model for Firefox is going to change in the near future, and therefore uh, it will be even less vulnerable. On the other hand, for the web login detection, what we could do as users, it's also very simple. Uh, if you can afford this trade-off, you can just disable third-party cookies and uh, to access the third-party cookies for websites, and that will save you from this kind of attack. You can also try it out uh, on the test, and uh, you will see uh, how it helps. But there are also some extensions that might help with this, and uh, you can also use uh, uh, even more cruel things, just disabling all the JavaScript or uh, things like that. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. <laughs>